the world's oceans cover around 70% of the planet's surface, making our seas the Earth's largest habitat. All life began in the ocean. And yet for a very long time, we knew and understood so little about marine life. It's only in the past century that we've come to understand that all life on Earth is completely dependent on the ocean. It is life in the ocean that produces the oxygen that we breathe. It is the oceans that are pumping the air masses which determine our climate. Bursting with life and teeming with mysteries, the ocean contains some of the most amazing habitats on Earth. has one of the largest maritime areas in Europe. We have over 880,000 kilometers square of marine territory. That's 10 times the size of our land area. Our marine area provides jobs, serves as a transportation link for goods and people, and plays an important role in our culture. And while we now have a better understanding of how interconnected we are with the living processes in the ocean, we are threatening the health of the oceans with our activities. With so much at stake, what can we do to better protect the health of the seas around Ireland? We think of Ireland as a small island on the edge of the North Atlantic. But with over 220 million acres of designated continental shelf, our marine area extends far out to sea, making Ireland one of the largest marine territories in the EU. You kind of see a little glimmer of pride in people because they're going to think, oh, we're actually bigger than we, we think we are and I think that's kind of underrepresented in, in our mindset. To find out about Ireland's marine environment, I'm here in West Cork to meet with marine scientist Maraid O'Donovan. The ocean, I suppose, is this life-giving resource, this reservoir of life-giving goods and services. We're kind of disconnected from that. I think we're, a lot of people are unaware of um, the extent to which the ocean sustains life. You know, we, we think a lot of forests and like places like the Amazon as being the lungs of the planet, when in actual fact there is a greater proportion of, our, of oxygen coming from, from the ocean. Largely down to microscopic phytoplankton, they produce their food through photosynthesis, so it's using energy from the sun. They use carbon dioxide and they produce oxygen. Somewhere between 50 and 85% of the oxygen produced on the planet actually comes from photosynthesizing organisms in the ocean. Isn't that incredible? Like, you'd never look out to the ocean and think that this is producing a whole pile of oxygen for me to breathe, for all of us to breathe. It's like the heart and lungs of the planet, you know, just, uh, just pulsing, pulsing oxygen into the atmosphere. That's amazing. So we're all completely dependent on the ocean in ways that we just don't imagine in our daily lives. As well as supporting life, the ocean also provides many livelihoods for coastal communities. I'm right, who are the main people then who would have a livelihood drawn off our marine environment? We think a lot, I suppose, of fishermen. We associate the fishing industry as, as being the marine industry, but in actual fact, there's greater awareness emerging of the, of the blue economy, so you can consider the blue economy kind of anything to do with water. And that includes tourism, the Wild Atlantic Way, for example, and every business along the way is part of the blue economy. Any time we see a humpback, we try to get the underside of its tail as photo ID. And the most exciting thing to watch with whales is when they go feeding like this, lunge feeding, and they come torching out the water at high speed. And the seas are home to more than half of all wildlife on Earth. I can't believe we're watching a baby dolphin. Yeah. 
right beside mom. <laughs> There's so much wildlife out at sea. A lot of it we, we barely know about. Yeah, it's amazing. I suppose it's the ocean and the marine environment in general is home to such a diversity of ecosystems and habitats. So much so that even within, within Irish marine territory, there are probably habitats that, that are yet to be discovered. So what does Maraid think the chances are of us actually seeing a whale today? Yeah, they can be quite elusive, so they dive for a while and then they come up and take a few blows. Yeah. Um, there we go! Oh, wow. <laughs> it's quite amazing, like even some of the big whales, we don't know where they go when they're not in Ireland, you know? And they're, they're huge, they're some of the biggest animals on, on the planet, or the biggest animals on the planet. And you can't really mess with any part of the system because there's no way of understanding how that will affect the integrity of, of the whole marine system and that biodiversity is a, an incredibly important resource to value and to protect as well. So everything is interconnected and interdependent really? Absolutely, yeah. We're dependent on that interconnectivity because that's how the whole system functions and that's how it provides us with, um, with the amazing things that it does. The seas provide us with so much, but how appreciative are we of this bounty? Every four years, the Environmental Protection Agency assesses the state of Ireland's environment and the main pressures placed on it. And the marine environment is very much part of this assessment. To find out what the main pressures are, I'm meeting with EPA marine scientist Dr. Sorkin Ni Longford. Sorka, what are you looking at here? So I'm looking at um, seaweed. I'm doing some seaweed monitoring here today. What we're looking at is the species richness, and that will tell us about the eco ecological health or status of our seaweed on our, on our rocky shore. And what kind of seaweeds have we got in this rock pool here? Yeah, so we have some nice diversity of seaweeds here. So for example, we have Carolina officinalis. So these are really interesting. Okay. And actually, if we had uh, a reduction in pH, so if we have um, pressures like ocean acidification, then these species would be ones that would be under threat. So the, the types of seaweed that are growing here is an indicator of the health of the, the water out there as well. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, we can Amazing. say that's true. Yeah. We tend to think of the ocean as being so vast that our activities are never really going to have a serious impact on the health of out there. But that's not really the case, is it? No, it isn't. Unfortunately, the fish we eat and also what we do in our lives will impact the sea. And that's quite hard to monitor that, I imagine, over such a large area to get a clear picture. But still, we do have a good idea of the health of the ocean. We do, we do. We have a lot of monitoring that goes on with ships that are, that are out monitoring. But also, we have a lot of satellite data now. Um, for a lot of different things and this really helps us to get a, a wider picture of what's happening in the open ocean. Overall now, what, what is the health that you've been seeing in the last few years of monitoring? Our coasts and our seas are quite clean, but they're not as biologically diverse and as productive as we would like them to be. And what are the main pressures that are impacting the health of the marine environment? Yeah, so the main pressures, and I suppose an order of importance, would be overfishing, um, climate change, unfortunately, and then we would have plastics, both large plastics and microplastics. We would have noise, we would have um, some chemicals in our areas, in our ocean waters. So these would be the main ones, really, that we would consider to impact. And overfishing is coming out as, as the top impact. It is, yeah, it's coming out as the top impact. We know this through information that we have on both commercial and non-commercial fish. About 70% of our coastal, if you drew a circle around Ireland, of our coastal benthic areas have been impacted um, by overfishing and bottom trawling. A lot of fish will, will, will be at the bottom because they're nursery grounds and feeding grounds down there. And how does overfishing affect the health of the wider marine environment? Well, overfishing affects the whole marine environment because when we take out one species, we're impacting on the whole food web. So it disrupts the whole 
ecosystem. The more healthy an yeah. ecosystem is, yeah. the more it's able to withstand the pressures from things like climate change. Oh, absolutely. When we have large biodiversity and species richness, it can, it, it show, it's been shown that this can actually uh, make the system more resilient and it will come back um, faster. Fishing per se is not inherently bad for the ocean. But when fish is caught faster than stocks can replenish, this is overfishing and this is a problem. Some types of fishing can damage fish spawning habitats too, further reducing the ability of populations to recover. As an island nation, fishing has always been economically and socially very important. So why, when it comes to overfishing, is it so often claimed that Ireland is one of the worst offenders? Overfishing is the most significant driver of declines in ocean wildlife. More than 300 scientists from across Europe, including around 50 Irish experts, have warned that overfishing is a clear and present threat to biodiversity, climate and human health. They sent a joint statement to the EU Commissioner for the Environment, Ocean and Fisheries calling for urgent action. For decades, EU waters have been overfished, but this was due to stop with a deadline to adopt sustainable fisheries by 2020. So why isn't the problem solved already? It's the product of years of um, short-termism in terms of political decision-making. Essentially, our fisheries ministers go into an EU level and lobbying for overfishing. So knowing that the catch limits that they were uh, lobbying for were above scientific advice, but still going ahead year on year, driving down the fish populations to the point of collapse. Are there many fisheries that Ireland depends on that have already collapsed? Yeah. Celtic Sea Herring, Northwest Herring are a very good example. Those fish stocks have collapsed. Scientists advise that there should be zero catch. Um, so that the, the fishermen took the pragmatic decision to call on the uh, decision makers to close those fisheries. How do we make sure that we don't over harvest these fish to the point that stocks start to collapse? We're actually very fortunate, Anya. We have some excellent marine scientists, both here in Ireland at an EU level, that tell us exactly what level we should set fishing limits at to make sure that our fisheries activities are sustainable. And how much does Ireland stick to our maximum sustainable yield? Well, Birdwatch Ireland's own research has shown that for 2020, 51% of our stocks uh, were set above scientific advice. And that's despite the EU 2020 deadline to end overfishing for all stocks. We, we know from independent scientists at an EU level that across the Northeast Atlantic, 32% uh, of fish stocks are critically overfished. So they're outside safe biological limits and 38% are overfished. And is it viable that we might have healthy fisheries again, like in, in a better state than what we have now in 20 or 30 years? If we implement sustainable fisheries management, if we take an ecosystem-based approach, we can recover fish stocks, we can have a healthy marine environment that will benefit you know, marine wildlife and coastal communities. And what are the opportunities if we were to stick with the maximum sustainable yield each year? Organisations like the New Economics Foundation have estimated that if we were to actually um, restore fish stocks, we could generate 270 million euros in additional revenue and create 2,200 additional jobs. And would there be a lag time involved in that? Would we have to ease up the fishing pressure for a few years before we start to see those increases in economic return and environmental health? Well, for some fish stocks that are critically overfished, it would take some time. What we have seen over the last few years is that when we do take those steps, that those stocks do bounce back and that, we, we, that um, fishing communities do reap the, the economic benefits. Continuing to take so much fish each year that stocks can't even recover, well, that makes no sense at all. Overfishing is devastating the ability of the seas to provide. And it's not only marine life that suffers, the ramifications for coastal communities are enormous. Castletown Bear in Cork is Ireland's main fishing port in the southwest. Is that about as big as they get? Or? Yeah, yeah, that is about as big as they get. And would these all be for export then? 90% of our month will go to France and Spain. 90% goes to France and Spain, okay. Yeah. It's a good place to find out about the impacts declining fish stocks are having on coastal communities 
and learn what the local fisheries co-op think can be done about it. How many people are employed here at the processing plant? We have 120 people working here ashore and in our fishing boats we employ 340 people. And how much of the employment or the, the economy in Castletown Bear is dependent on the fishing oh, yeah. industry? Castletown Bear in a government study was 95% dependent on fishing for its economic survival. Wow. As it is like, which is huge, very important. So the fishing is absolutely crucial? That's cru crucial for not only just Castletown Bear but rural Ireland. We have boats like from the Arden Islands, Dingle, Phoenix, Carsaveen, Castletown Bear, Skull, Baltimore, Kinsale, Crosshaven, Union Hall. Like so it's all as part of the, the all, all as part of the co-op. We're owned by the fishermen, 100 percent And um, we have no shares, we have no shareholders, it's the fishermen, and our job is to do everything that we can to develop the fishing industry, get markets so the fishermen can make money. Fishing is the economic bedrock of coastal communities like Castletown Bear. So it's understandable that there are concerns around the reduction of fish catches in any given year. And this could immediately impact jobs and livelihoods, even if that would allow fish stocks to recover. Herein lies the tension between short-term gains and longer-term sustainability. Sustainability is something that concerns you, or falling fish stocks something that concerns you? Communities like Castle and Bear couldn't survive if we didn't have sustainability. We want the fish off our coast to be here next year, in 20 years, and 50 years. We can't uproot and just move Castle and Bear. So you believe in the idea of the quotas, just that Ireland hasn't got our fair share of the quotas? Yeah, that, that's the big battle, like. Eh? But even the quotas that are set, they're set above the total allowable catch, so they're often set above what's deemed to be scientifically sustainable. That's like, you know, that's not really true, like in a lot of cases. Some of the stocks are quite good. Like we want them at MSY, which is the maximum sustainable yield. And the science gets it wrong a lot of times, like there, like, you know, with the mackerel quota last year, I think was increased by 15%. The year before it was reduced by 15%. Because there is a lot of trading at the moment, isn't there, between the scientific advice and then the political imperative to increase quotas, and it's a negotiation there, and that's how the quotas are set. Yeah, but not, not in every species. Like, in a lot of cases, some species never change, but it's important like, that the information you give is correct. You know, like, fishermen will work with you if you treat them as part of the solution. Like, we made the decision in the Celtic Sea, and like we did in the herrings, like, that the herrings were going to fail if you didn't do something. Because Celtic All Sea herring totally collapsed, didn't Yeah, it? totally collapsed, like, there, and that's an important fishery for Ireland, because it's the one fishery that we got 80% of the quota. There was a plan put in place with fishermen and a committee, the Celtic Sea Management Committee, trying to make that fish recover. Now, we know, like, that it'll be at least three years before we'll have recovery. We want our stocks to survive. We want to have nursery, nursery areas, but if you're taking something off of somebody and you're giving them nothing for it, like what do you expect? Like people have to live, people have bank bills to pay, like people have crews to take care of. The only way, like that, you make money here, like is when you bring in fish. But I do think that the politicians need to come down onto the ground and meet with the people, get the scientists, get the fishermen, and where big hard decisions have to be taken put compensation packages in place. So that there's a Spanish board, a Dutch board, a German board, like you know, it might be better to give them money to tie up rather than allow them to continue out there to chase after a resource that is going down. Do you think the wider fishing community would share your view that it's all right to reduce the catch based on scientific advice as long as the compensation is in place? I, I can't stress this enough. We need the stocks that are in Irish waters to be sustainable, to make sure that we have a fishing community in Castleone Bear and in all the other ports I mentioned in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time. If we wipe it out, it's gone forever. Despite the quota system, many fish stocks are still being overfished. The problem seems to be that there are too many boats chasing too few fish, with profound implications for fishing communities who rely on these stocks for their livelihoods. And as the dust is settling on Brexit, an agreement that will severely impact Ireland's fishing industry, the pressure to find a way to manage fisheries sustainably has never been so urgent. If managed sustainably, this renewable resource could provide one of Ireland's richest renewable assets.
As one of Europe's largest marine nations, surely we should be leading the way in promoting sustainable fisheries. Barrister Sarah Ryan Enright is a specialist in marine environmental law and believes the law could be used to strengthen and expand marine protection. Sarah, can you tell me what is a marine protected area? Well, a marine protected area is a geographically defined area in the marine environment, which is designated and managed to achieve specific conservation objectives. So you could have the strictest type of marine protected area on the one hand, which involves no human activities at all. These are called no-take zones. So all that would be allowed in a no-take zone would be scientific research, for example. And then you can have a whole other um, spectrum of activities that may or may not occur. Um, in marine protected areas. So you may have some level of fishing allowed, for example. You may have some level of tourism allowed. So it really depends on the conservation needs of the site. Marine protected areas are a particularly effective tool to help restore marine ecosystems, safeguard sensitive marine habitats, including fish spawning grounds, and help sustain productive fisheries in the long term. And we need to do more than just draw lines on maps. It will also be necessary to actively restore habitats, letting fish reproduce and helping to bring back lost abundance. There is much to be done. Globally, it has been acknowledged we are in the midst of a serious biodiversity crisis and that we are facing into the sixth mass extinction, many scientists have said. And so marine protected areas globally have been acknowledged as one solution to the biodiversity crisis because they allow species to recover. They can also be used to protect migratory routes for many marine species. So currently at the global level, only 7% of our oceans are protected, which is actually quite low. So the marine protected areas will help resilience of certain habitats yes. and fish stocks and marine habitats, but unless we remove the actual pressure, yes. we're not going to help marine biodiversity to recover. Yes, I think we need to tackle the causes of the problems. Would you say that we would benefit and our, the health of our marine environment would benefit from having more marine protected areas? Absolutely. You have increased fisheries both inside a marine protected area and outside. Um, you are able to restore the marine biodiversity within the site. Habitats are restored. And also there are socio-economic benefits because marine protected areas attract tourists from all over the world. And you know, once fisheries are replenished, um, that also leads to increased food security for coastal communities and also an improved economy. Of course, the important thing to remember is we must create effective marine protected areas. And that means allocating sufficient resources for monitoring and enforcement as well. So designating 30% of our oceans as marine protected areas, that won't do it. There needs to be more conservation action. Yes, um, I mean, it's, it's one thing to, um, to designate an area as a marine protected area, and it's another thing to implement it. While Ireland currently protects only 2% of our marine territory with designated areas, we have committed to protecting 10% by 2020 and 30% by 2030. If implemented properly, marine protected areas would allow for a recovery of fish populations and other marine life. The benefits to biodiversity and communities dependent on fisheries are far reaching with pressure on fisheries likely to rise as a result of Brexit, there is no time to lose. We now have the knowledge. We understand how to allow stocks to recover. <laughs>